Thank you, Dr. Benavides. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Don Dee Lee. I'm the design team lead of Ember Aerospace. Today, we'll be covering our system validation review for our multi-stage rocket system. On the agenda today, we'll be talking about our mission concept and objectives, our design overview, concept of operations, design structure tree and system descriptions, as well as a demonstration of our configuration management. Then we'll jump right into our key subsystem validation tests, and we'll wrap it up with our conclusion. Our design con team consists of myself, the product manager, the assistant product manager, Blake Games, the integration team, the Nolan twins, Mr. Kyle Noland, and Tyler Noland. Stage one team, Jacob Meyer, and Joseph Mena. Then stage two, Emily Lambert, and Yanova Book. Lastly, on the payload pairing team, Tarun Shankar, and Chloe McClellan. All right, our mission objectives are in three categories. These are derived from a request or proposal from a customer. First, the staging. The system should be uh, consisting of a first stage, second stage, and payload pairing. Under operation, the system should be unguided, reusable, and recoverable. And lastly, and most importantly, is the scientific aspect of this mission. The entire rocket supports a modeling and simulation uh, package that was developed by the team. The rocket itself contains avionics on board that will de determine the state and high precision uh, telemetry data through the entire mission duration. We'll use that data to validate our performance modeling and tell us a little bit about what went wrong or what we can improve on. Our altitude objectives are tiered in primary, secondary, and tertiary objectives. We'll be focusing on the tertiary objectives. All the design work was conducted for the lower limit of 11,700 meters to the upper limit of 12,300 meters. Our mission constraints have four main categories. The first is financial, given to us by the College of Engineering for both semesters. The entire system must cost less than $1,550. Next, the FAA regulations surrounding the use of amateur rocketry. And after that, the launch site regulations that require some specifications. Lastly, our total installed impulse for both stages will be 5120 newton seconds. Our plan was to have the entire system validated by April 15, 2018. Unfortunately, that didn't happen, and we'll elaborate on that today. Let's dive right into our design. There's three main segments here, stage one, stage two, and the payload pair. All three of these segments are fully independent. They have their own microcontrollers and avionics packages. The stage one and stage two systems have their propulsive elements. That's the orange and the white systems there. And lastly, the payload bearing houses our uh, scientific experiment. Our concept of operations has seven main phases, beginning with the launch phase of stage one ignition. After stage one burns out, it's ejected from the system and has its own parachute, after which the stage two is ignited. Stage two burns out and the uh, combined stage two and halo fairing systems co store their mutual apogee. At apogee, these systems are separated and they, own have, they, they each deploy their own parachutes in a smaller, partially deployed configuration. At a lower altitude, these parachutes are expanded and to reduce the terminal velocity. Lastly, these systems are recovered on the ground. It's important to note that during stage one, we're reaching about Mach 1, and during stage two at the end, the maximum velocity we reach is around Mach 2.5. Before we begin, I'd like to make a quick statement about validation. The team is very confident in the high-level design of our rocket and our system, and it's very capable of achieving the mission objectives. However, some of the areas still remain in the critical design phase, so as a result, validation testing in these areas is a little premature. So instead, this presentation in those areas will focus on what we expect to happen as a result of those validations and what implications those results might have on the flight. Lastly, these critical design areas will contain recommendations for modifications. At this point, I'd like to introduce Blake Games to talk about the design structure tree. Thank you, Gandhi. Hello, everyone. My name is Blake Games, and I'll be going over the design structure tree. So this is our design structure tree. So uh, at the very top, we have our system of systems, which is our MSRS or rocket. And then that's broken down into four systems, our stage one system, our stage two system, our payload pairing system, and our ground station. Then those are our payload pairing is broken down into our avionics subsystem, a structure subsystem, and a recovery subsystem. Our ground station is broken down into the two subsystems of a launch control and a launch tower. Our stage one and our stage two systems are identical, and they're broken down into a structure, a propulsion, recovery, and uh, staging, and our avionics. And then those are further broken down into their own components. Today we'll be mainly going over through the subsystem validations. 
So this is taking a look at our stage one system. The point of our stage one system is to boost the MSRS system off the ground and then to eventually separate from the second stage. The total length of the stage one comes out to be 117 centimeters long. It has an outer diameter of 5.6 centimeters. The mass is approximately 3.4 kilograms. And the motor on this uh, stage one has 3,051 newton seconds of impulse. This is our stage two system. Uh, the point of our stage two system is to provide impulse to the system to reach the altitude objective. The total length of the system is 108 centimeters long. And the outer diameter is 4.2 centimeters. The mass comes out to be about 1.4 kilograms. And the motor on this stage has an impulse of 902 newton seconds. The payload fair, uh, fairing system is the purpose is to house the scientific payload. It houses all of our avionics, which will be tracking our uh, altitude. And the length comes out to be 53 centimeters long. It has an outer diameter of 4.2 centimeters, a mass of uh, about 0.5 kilograms, and this stage does not have a motor. So this is taking a look at our total uh, system of systems. On the top there, you can see the first configuration. This configuration is initia initially what, uh, what it'll be launching. And then in our second configuration, this will be what's coasting up to Apogee. The total length of the rocket is approximately 262 centimeters long. The mass is about 5.33 kilograms. And the impulse, the total impulse of the rocket comes out to be about 3,953 newton seconds. This is our ground station system. It initiates the launch of the rocket and it stabilizes the MSRS until it can be stabilized aerodynamically. The uh, ground station consists of our launch control and our launch tower. And on the right hand side of the screen, you can see the launch uh, tower being fully built. So now we're going to take a quick look at our configuration management. Uh, this is our product structure tree. Our product structure tree is basically a breakdown of all the different uh, sub-assemblies sub of the rocket, all the way from the top level system of systems, how the stages go together, and then it's broken down and to all the way to how the nuts and bolts come together. And right, real quick, we'll go in to show you how our Excel works of our product structure tree. So this is taking a look at the left-hand side of the product structure tree. I'm, uh, we're going to concentrate right here on the stage one aft internals. We have uh, two hyperlinks here. The first hyperlink will connect us to our bill of materials. And here we have listed all of our different parts that the aft internals is made up of. And then next to that, we have our part numbers. If you're to click on one of your part numbers, that'll take us into our part drawings where we can see all the dimensions of the different parts. Going back up to our product structure tree, the next link we have down is our uh, assembly drawings. And this is basically our instructions of how all the different parts of the assemblies go together. And then these hyperlinks, we have, uh, these hyperlinks are linked on to all the different assemblies of the system. And at this time, I'll now be passing it over to Kyle Nolan to talk about our propulsion subsystem. All right, thank you, Blake. Hello, I'm Kyle Nolan, and I'll be talking about our propulsion subsystem. So our stage one propulsion subsystem has a 54 millimeter commercially available motor case. It also has a forward closure to go with it and a custom graphite nozzle. The propellant that we're using in there has six grains and this is an experimental propellant that we've developed ourselves. Uh, stage two is very similar, however it uses 38 millimeter components and it has six propellant grains, however two of the propellant grains have different uh, inner diameters than the other propellant grains. So the, pro the propellant we'll be using has an ammonium perchlorate oxidizer, a Luna powder fuel, HTPV binder with a curative and a plasticizer. So the objective of the stage one propulsion subsystem is to propel stage two and the payload fairing to a state where stage two can then get the payload fairing to the altitude objective. And then similarly, similarly for stage two, Stage two, uh, the propulsion subsystem should propel the payload bearing to the MSRS altitude objective. So here are some of the requirements for our propulsion subsystem. We have the total impulse requirements for each stage, as well as a maximum thrust, which will limit the amount of acceleration that the components of the rocket will have to experience. Then the burn time requirements and a propellant burn rate requirement. 
So the first test we did with this was a propellant test. The purpose of this test was to determine the burn rate of our experimental propellant uh, experimentally, and then also to improve our propulsion simulation model using the data that we got from this test. And then in this test, we were also able to validate characteristic exhaust velocity and burn rate requirements. So for this test, we had three motors. Uh, they had identical propellant brake configurations. However, each mode has the motor had a different nozzle throat diameter, which varied the pressure and burn rate of each of the motors. We collected the data using a pressure transducer, a load cell, and a camera. And we completed this test on April 2nd at the ember Middle rocket test cell. So here we have a video of our first motor. Uh, you'll notice that before it fully ignites, it has two pops where it's partially igniting. We believe this is because not all of the grains uh, ignited soon enough, which, ca which caused it to not reach enough pressure to sustain the reaction initially. Despite the initial stutter at the beginning, we were still able to get very good data from this. Uh, here we have in orange the original prediction from our propulsion model. In black we have our experimental values, and then green is our modified prediction based off of the based off of the data we got from this test. The modified prediction much more closely matches the overall total impulse that we get, uh, as well as a, a lot of the other characteristics of the test. So here we have the numerical results. The imp total impulse, specific impulse and pressures were lower than we expected, and this is resulting from a lower burn rate than expected. However, we believe with the data we got from these tests, we were able to correct for this in our new model. Uh, so here we have a, our second motor. <laughs> here we have our second motor. And uh, unfortunately, this motor had, didn't ignite very well and had sporadic thrust, so we weren't able to get any data from this test. And uh, you'll see, be able to see why in the video. Fortunately, from our third motor, we were able to get a very good test. Uh, this one ignited al almost immediately. Uh, however, it still didn't quite ignite as quickly as we would like. So here we have, again, the original, experimental, and modified predictions for this test. Uh, the modified prediction is much closer in total impulse and uh, thrust than the original prediction was. Uh, it's important to note here that both of the predictions expect a longer burn time than we saw in the experimental values. Uh, we believe this is because of erosive burning due to the length of the motor. Uh, and but while that erosive burning occur, appears to have occurred, we still get a similar total impulse value and uh, similar thrust magnitudes throughout the burn. So here again is our uh, numerical res results for it, and we believe that we have accounted for these now using the data from this test. So uh, for the requirements from this test, we were able to experimentally validate uh, characteristic exhaust velocity as well as a propellant burn rate. And then using the data from this test, we have our updated propulsion model, which we then use to uh, modify our stage one and stage two propellant grades in order to ensure that we meet our objectives. So our second test that we wanted to do was our propulsion validation test. The objective of this test was to measure the total impulse, thrust, and burn time of our stage one and stage two flight motors. 
uh, and this test would validate requirements for total impulse thrust and propellant burn time. So in this test we have a stage one and stage two fully assembled flight motor and propulsion subsystem. Uh, we used the same setup to collect our data, and this was scheduled for Thursday, April 19th. However, we had to call it off due to high wind speeds, and that was immediately followed by a local fire ban on the pyrotechnics, which prevents us from doing it later. Uh, so here we have the expected results from our stage one motor. Uh, you'll notice we have a small bump in the chamber pressure at the beginning, which is caused by the the, the inner diameter of our propellant terrain actually being slightly smaller than our nozzle diameter at the very start of the burn. And then at the end you'll see a drop off where the propellant finishes burning. So while we weren't able to experimentally validate the motor, uh, based off of the data we got from the previous test, we are very confident that if we had performed this test, we would have been able to experimentally validate it. So here are the expected results for our stage two motor. Again, you see the small spike at the beginning. And then we also have a, a drop off in the middle where two of the grains, which have a larger initial inner diameter, finish burning first. And then at the end, we have the remaining four grains burning to completion. So again, we weren't able to experimentally validate this. However, we are confident that if we had fired the motor, we would have been able to meet our objectives. And now, Emily Lambert will talk about the ignition component. Thank you, Kyle. Good afternoon. My name is Emily Lambert, and I'll be going over the ignition component validation. For the ignition component for stage one, we considered it for, a, for static firing conditions that would be controlled by the ground control system. For the second stage, we wanted to can take into consideration uh, lower pressure and the effects of vibrating on igniting and the danger of not igniting the second stage. Our final design was a disco cannon fuse that will be ignited using an electric match. The objectives and requirements of the stage one and stage two ignition, ignition was to ignite the propellant with a reliability of greater than 90%. We would like to, in the future, improve this requirement and include the conditions in which the, in which the propellant must ignite by including the ignition time and ignition pressure. The objectives for the ignition reliability test is to validate the reliability greater than 90%. For this, we are going to use six three-inch uh, motors with a half-inch bore diameter and record the thrust data and from there derive the pressure to determine the reliability of the ignition. Here is the experimental setup. What we have is a test stand motor piece and nozzle. It's important to know that this is the same test that was going to be completed with the propulsion validation, which we were unable to do due to safety and fire concerns. Uh, and since we were not unable to test, we were unable to experimentally validate the ignition component. Um, from this, we've learned that we would like to do more detailed requirements for our ignition component, and then also uh, record the pressure data directly as opposed to deriving it from the thrust data. Now we're going over our staging subsystem validation. Here we have our two couplers. On top, we have an aluminum coupler that interfaces with the stage one and then conically transitions to the stage two diameter. On the bottom, we have our uh, coupler that interfaces with the stage two and the payload bearing that is made out of fiberglass. The separation charge is made of black powder and is located inside of the couplers. In order to separate the two stages, the press fit pressure, which is created by an interference fit between the fuselage and the coupler, needs to be overcome in addition to separating the stages a distance of eight meters in less than five seconds after separation. Uh, the objectives of the subsystem are to separate the stage one and stage two system after stage one burnout and then separate the stage two and payload bearing at apogee. The requirements are to have a change in pitch and yaw of less than 10 degrees of the stage two system during separation and also have a separation distance of eight meters in less than five seconds. For the staging separation test, we would like to record the separation velocity between stage one and stage two, and then also measure the change in pitch and yaw. The, for the test, we would like to suspend it, stage one and two, and use a background with known refer reference distances and then also measure the change in angle of stage two and use a high speed camera to record the data. 
Our original plan for this test was to conduct it at the rock climbing wall on campus here, from which we could suspend the stages from approximately 15 feet and use a background to measure the known distances. Unfortunately, due to concerns from safety, we had to move this test outdoors. Here is our setup. Um, we used a ladder from which we could suspend stage one and stage two, and we put mats below to protect the stages from damage. Here is a short video of the um, separation. We have a real time at first, and then it transitions to a slow motion video. still photos of the separation. As you can see, we would like to uh, suspend the stage one and stage two systems from higher in order to collect more data points. And due to windy conditions, we are not able to use the background reference. And we are also not able to use our high-speed camera for this test. Uh, due to all those reasons, we're unable to experimentally validate the stage one separation. Uh, our future improvements would be to test indoors, use the high-speed camera with the back mark backgrounds, and also use a higher suspension point. Now I'd like to pass it back off to Blake Eames to go over our recovery subsystem. Thanks, Emily. Hi again, my name is Blake, and I'll be going over the recovery subsystem. So this is an uh, overview of the recovery design system that's located on all of our uh, stages of the rocket. It consists of a parachute, a parachute protector, a shock cord, an eye bolt, a coupling nut, and a threaded rod which holds the parachute into the system. Also not pictured here is a cable cutter that we put on the second stage and our payload fairing, which allows us to uh, just create a partially deployed state of the parachute. So for our recovery objectives, the recovery subsystem should deliver the system to a safe ground impact speed, and the tracking component should make the payload system locatable. For recovery requirements, our horizontal uh, displacement shall be less than or equal to six kilometers. The black powder uh, ejection pressure created by black powder charge shall be greater than or equal to 0.75 megapascals. And the partial deployment to the full, deploy full deployment transition time shall be less than or equal to one second. So for, uh, to test some of these requirements, we created a partial to full deployment test. And the test objectives of this was to measure the time for the partial deployment of the parachute to transition to the full deployment of the parachute. Uh, and then we also wanted to, to qualitatively analyze the effectiveness of our black powder charges to be able to eject our parachute from our fuselage. So to do this, we wanted to simulate the forces that the parachute would be uh, experiencing in flight. And so we decided that we uh, wanted to be able to launch the ejected parachute out of the back of a moving uh, vehicle. And so what we ended up doing was creating a test stand out of two by fours that would house our stage two fuselage. And then we packed our parachute and our shock board into the fuselage. We accelerated to 35 miles per hour at our test site. We deployed our parachute, initiated the partial deployment, uh, waited a short amount of time, and then uh, initiated um, and then recorded the time it took to transition from our partial to our full deployed states. And so this is the cable cutter that I previously mentioned. Uh, the cable cutter, the point of the cable cutter is to restrict the shroud lines of the parachute from being able to fully uh, release. And so it's located along the length of the shroud lines and it restricts those using a zip tie. And so for our expected results, we expected the black powder to eject the parachute, and then we were also looking for that less than one second transition time. This graph here is a graph of our translational velocity in the vertical direction. If you take a look at our partial deployment location, at this point we're traveling about 50 meters per second, and then later on in the flight we have a full deployment uh, to the full uh, fully deployed parachute configuration. And this transition time is assumed to be almost instantaneous, and that's where we get this less than one second transition time requirement. So looking at our results, these pictures are taken from the parachute deployment. Uh, you can see on the right hand side, we just are starting to see some of the smoke from the black powder charge coming out. And then in these pictures, you can see the part, uh, parachute is partially deployed. 
And now looking at our partial to full deployment results, you can see on the left hand side the parachutes in its partially deployed configuration. And then on the right hand side you can see a white cloud of smoke. This is the smoke that's being created by the black powder from the cable cutter. On the left hand side the, you can see the uh, smoke is just starting to dissipate now. And then later on in the test you see that we, can have, we have our full deployment of the parachute. So analyzing the results, we, were, we did successfully have a parachute ejection. However, the transition time, we were looking for that less than one second uh, transition time, and the exp uh, we actually, it took 20 seconds, so this is not validated. We think this is most likely due to the fact that during, as we were driving, the wind was twisting the shroud lines, and when we fired the cable cutter, it took time for the shroud lines to unwind, and the parachute be able to fully unfurl. We'd like to alleviate, to alleviate this, we'd like to consider possibly doing this in a wind tunnel. And at this time, I'd now like to pass it over to Chloe McClellan, who can go over, who will go over track to the range. Thank you, Blake. Hello, everyone. My name is Chloe McClellan, and as Blake said, I'll be going over the tracking range and accuracy validation. So this test shall measure the distance at which the tracking component can be tracked, the accuracy of the coordinates transmitted, and the functionality at the maximum distance or the horizontal displacement of up to six kilometers. So for the requirements we're validating, it's the tracking to the distance of less than 25 meters from actual location, transmitting the GPS coordinates with a distance error of less than 25 meters, and also validating the frequency of the transmission. So this is our initial test setup. At point one was the initial receiver position where the technician was located, and point two was the initial transmitter position. That was where the test manager was located. As we did not get coordinates from the initial transmitter, uh, initial receiver position, the technician moved to the backup receiver position denoted as point three. We didn't receive coordinates there, so the technician proceeded along the route to point two near the transmitter. So this is our Big Red B uh, transmitter receiver pair. It has a six mile open air range and 900 megahertz transmitting frequency. So the receiver did not show coordinates until approximately 250 meters away from the transmitter, but the coordinates were accurate to within 25 meters with a distance error of only 11.18. So as you can see, our range was not validated and our accuracy was validated. And some improvements that we'd like to make to this test is to upgrade the, uh, the receiver antenna and the transmitter antenna, and also do a plane or other high altitude test, which is an air test to make it um, more like the intended use for the transmitter receiver duo. And this could also vary the angle between the transmitter and receiver in order to determine the angle at which the communication cuts out. At this point, I'd like to introduce uh, Joseph Mena to talk about the structure subsystem. Thank you, Chloe. Hello, everybody. My name is Joseph Mena, and I will be going over the structure subsystem. The structure subsystem of stage one and stage two is made up of three components, a fuselage component, an internal structure, and a stability component. The structure subsystem of the payload bearing consists of three parts, a nose cone tip, an ogive nose cone, and a payload bearing fuselage, though not pictured here is the retention rod that goes with the nose cone tip. The objectives of the structure subsystem of all these systems is that the structure subsystem should endure dynamic loading and provide passive stability throughout the flight duration. It should house the various subsystems and it should be reusable. The requirements of the fuselage component are that it should have a margin of safety greater than zero for the ultimate compressive, shear, and tensile strengths. And as well, it shall have a total strain that is less than the ultimate strain values of our material of choice. The objectives of the fuselage compression test are that it shall have a total strain. It shall measure the total strain on the fuselage components. 
and based off those measured strain values, it shall determine the total stress. This satisfies the requirements of the longitudinal and transverse strains, as well as the margins of safety for the ultimate compressive and shear strengths. And while it is not a requirement, we also observe the ultimate buckling strength. The test was set up by placing a hydraulic jack in the structures lab in AXFAB. The full rocket assembly was placed onto the hydraulic jack in the supports. The load data was uh, recorded with the load cell and the strain data was recorded on two, on four rosette strain gauges, two on stage one and two on stage two, each 180 degrees from the other. And the uh, hydraulic jack simulated dynamic loading. Our experimental results show that our uh, collected strain data, or our numerical strain data is shown here with the solid line, and our experimental strain data is shown here with the dashed line. Our, exper our results show that the exper experimental data is less than the numerical data at the maximum loading for the numerical strain. And for our experimental strain, for stage two, the experimental data, again shown with the dashed line, is greater than the numerical data. Uh, despite this, we have valid, experimentally validated all of our requirements in addition to the buckling stress. Uh, here we have the expe expected versus experimental data for stage two. We, we showed this due to the fact that stage two has a smaller cross-sectional area and thus will be subjected to higher stress values and will have lower margins of safety and higher strain values. Likely the reason for the percent difference between the experimental and expected data is due to the fact that we assume the material would be quasi-isotropic instead of the standard orthotropic that you would get with most composite materials. And now I'd like to hand it off to Tyler Nolan who will be going over the avionics. Thank you, Joseph. I'm Tyler Nolan and I'll be talking about our avionics subsystems. We have three avionic subsystems, one on each stage. They all have the same sensor package. So uh, shown here is the, uh, the avionics bay from stage one. Each avionics, package, each avionics package has a pressure sensor, an IMU, an accelerometer, a temperature sensor, and a, micro, and a microcontroller. In the IMU, there's an additional accelerometer, a gyroscope, and a magnetometer. So all of the avionics systems are uh, responsible for measuring and recording all of their sensor data. Uh, they are also responsible for uh, recording their estimated state data throughout the flight. In addition, each individual uh, package is responsible for uh, detecting and signaling certain events on the respective stages. On stage one, the avionics are responsible for detecting the stage one motor burnout, signaling the stage one separation, detecting the stage one apogee, and signaling the stage one parachute deployment. On stage two, the avionics are responsible for detecting the stage one motor burnout and separation, signaling stage two motor ignition, detecting the stage two apogee, signaling the stage two separation, and signaling the parachute deployment on stage two. The payload fairing avionics are responsible for detecting the payload fairing apogee, as well as its separation from stage two, and signaling the parachute deployment sequence for the payload fairing. To summarize the requirements that we are validating here, the avionics shall calculate and report altitude, velocity, orientation, and acceleration at a frequency greater than or equal to 24 hertz. Additionally, the avionics shall signal the parachute deployment sequences and stage separation after their respective events. For our processing and signaling tests, the objective was to demonstrate that the avionics could uh, detect important events and produce the correct output. The three uh, the events which were being detected were launch, motor burnout, and apogee. Uh, and then based off of detecting those events, it would signal stage separation or parachute deployment. For this test, the avionics were allowed 30 seconds to initialize on a stable surface. They were then lifted approximately one meter into the air and then lowered back onto the table. A uh, short while later, the avionics lit an LED, which signaled that it was signaling 
parachute deployment, and the time between those two events was measured with a stopwatch. For a state determination and data processing test, uh, which is our other avionics test, uh, the objective was to uh, demonstrate the capabilities to uh, calculate and record orientation and position uh, data, uh, as well as to test the process sample rate for the whole system. For this test, the, electron the electronics were once again allowed 30 seconds to initialize. We then rotated the whole package 90 degrees about its x-axis, allowed it to rest for another 30 seconds, and returned it back to its original orientation. We repeated that same process for the y and z axes. From these tests, we were able to uh, measure a recording frequency of 133 hertz, which is much greater than the 24 hertz requirement, so that's validated. The parachute deployment delay needed to be between uh, five seconds and 10 seconds, and we measured a 6.43 second delay with, uh, with a stopwatch. That's also validated. Similarly, for the, uh, the separation delay after the burnout, uh, which needed to be less than one second, we measured 0.27 seconds, which is also validated. Although we were able to validate our requirements, the state data, which we got from these tests, was not accurate enough for us to uh, implement the goals of our scientific model, our, or our scientific payload, where we wanted to compare our model to the actual flight data of a rocket. The main issue is with our de determination of orientation, where, we're, where we were simply uh, integrating gyroscope data in order to get that orientation. So in the state determination test that I mentioned earlier, we rotated the package 90 degrees on six different, for six different occasions, and each time it measured a different value from 90 degrees uh, with a significant range of variance. Additionally, from the gyroscope, uh, we get a behavior called random walk behavior, where the gyroscope bias drifts over time. Uh, and because we are integrating that gyro gyroscope data, that bias accumulates over time. So over a 12 minute static test, the, uh, the gyroscope measured almost 180 degrees of rotation in one axis. Uh, even with this, the drift and a small inaccuracy from integrating gyroscope data, we, it's still accurate enough to uh, signal the stage separation events and safely uh, check our orientation before igniting our second stage. And that, but that only works because the, uh, those events occur very shortly after launch. For detecting the full flight scale apogee, this, these sensors would not be able to detect that because, uh, because the air would accumulate too long over the coast period. However, we do have the pressure sensor on board, which would be our primary uh, way of detecting apogee. But the uh, state data accumulated from this sensor package would be insufficient for implementation of the scientific payload goals. The reason we need to integrate gyroscope data is because we're not able to fully observe our absolute orientation. So we would need an additional sensor, such as a sun sensor or a horizon sensor, in addition to the magnetometer on our IMU, in order to fully determine our absolute orientation. Uh, in addition to that, if we implemented our state observer, we would be able to uh, determine our state data with enough accuracy to be able to use our scientific data. Now I'll hand it back to Ganhee Lee, who will be concluding our presentation. Thank you, Tyler. Go ahead and conclude things up now. So as a review of the 10 validation plans that we presented today, of those 10, only three successfully validated all of our requirements. Those are indicated in green. After which, there were four additional tests that were not performed, and as a result, those requirements were not validated. Lastly, the three shown in red, those were conducted, but those requirements were not validated. Based off of all of our data that we've collected, and our most up-to-date simulation uh, and modeling, we're able to pre uh, create this following simulation here. We're getting just under 12 kilometers, 11.8 kilometers, and that is within our accepted margin for our altitude objectives. And the team is very confident that we can actually replicate a system that would be capable of achieving these results in real life. 
Now, having said that, we must evaluate some of the things that did go wrong and talk about what we need to do to make that happen. So if you look at our design process, we, approach, we use the V model approach to systems engineering. And the majority of our high level design work that we conducted during the conceptual studies phase is viable. We're very confident in that. However, during the system definition and concept definition phase, we ran into some trouble with requirements. A lot of our requirements were either incomprehensible, excuse me, uh, not complete, or lacked issues regarding uh, integration. And so those issues got propagated through through critical design, and it's really then when we started noticing some of these issues. So at that point, we'd have to take two steps backward to make one step forward, where we'd have to go back and fix a problem, but at that point, there'd have a big ripple effect causing a lot of design changes all the way throughout. And as such, we really ran out of time. So if you look at where we are today in validation, we are mostly focused on the subsystem level. And that's because we really couldn't take to the system and system of systems level because we ran into issues with integration. So some of the areas that we'd like to further validate, obviously the full flight test. That's one of the only ways that we could uh, fully validate our system of systems integrated together. After that, the aerodynamic stability testing, we really didn't have a good means of testing that on the ground. Uh, there is a wind tunnel here on campus, but it just doesn't offer the flow regimes that we're looking for. We also didn't have access to it. The motor mount load testing, that's the point that transfers the load from the rocket motor into the fuselage. Key stress concentrations occur there, and it's just a little bit of an oversight when we're making priorities there. Lastly, the ground impact testing, that's kind of based off of uh, our, our models are based more off of like rules of thumb there rather than uh, modeling, and so we need to better understand the dynamics there. Uh, critical design areas, this is really the meat of the matter. What's in between us and having a fully complete design? Uh, these areas just need a little bit more mathematical modeling and analysis. So first and foremost, the avionics. We've talked a little bit about that before. But the sensor package just is incomplete. We really would like to have full state observability there. And as such, we have much better ability to support our scientific mission. Uh, it is worth noting that we designed a full state observer using a common filter with a linearized model, but we weren't able to implement it due to uh, hardware limitations. Next, the pyrotechnic circuits. These refer to the uh, staging separation charges, the stage two ignition, the recovery deployment. While the business end of these is all right right now, it's more of the electrical engineering connections between that and the uh, avionics, uh, avionics phase. The issue there is that we haven't done enough like, analysis to make sure that the components aren't at risk of being damaged. Propulsion, uh, the ignition component just takes way too long to actualize. Uh, and that's largely due to the fact that there's once again rules of thumb there, not enough analysis put into things like the required energy input for our specific propellant composition, or maybe minimum chamber pressure or temperature, that kind of analysis. Moving on to structure, our aerodynamic profile, it really is at a preliminary design level for the coefficients. While we have pretty good semi-empirical understanding of supersonic uh, drag and lift coefficients, the pressure distribution is really uh, a first order approximation. It's really only valid for subsonic flow. That needs to be improved. Um, the ground impact, we've already covered that, so fatigue and vibration, you know, we have specific objectives regarding survival, reusability and survivability, so fatigue and vibration is a big component of that. We didn't actually do much analysis there, that's something we very much have the capability for and we would do. So lessons learned and recommendations. So especially on the system definition side, we learned a lot. So we learned a lot about what makes a good requirement, and unfortunately we learned the hard way what makes a bad requirement. Uh, and these mean that our requirements really should be comprehensive, meaning that Every system should be completely and explicitly defined in every function that it's going to have to perform in its uh, flight environment. And then the integration-based requirements have, have to additionally define how each system is expected to uh, mesh well with other systems. Our trade studies. We conducted a numerous amount of trade studies. However, we learned that the trade studies we conducted weren't thorough enough to be really helpful to us. They didn't dive deep enough to actually analyze how they would affect uh, things in the operating environment. And lastly, they didn't really, un we didn't fully understand the interest system implications of them. So looking at some administrative details, we've got our budget here. The most important thing to look at is the actual cost is just under $1,500, which is within budget. We were originally scheduled to be above budget, but we mitigated that through uh, donated components. The majority of our budget goes to propulsion. Our total labor hours across both semesters were 4,800 hours, with the majority of the time being spent in engineering, with right behind that the professional development in class. We'd like to thank the following individuals for all their help in the development of this project, especially our course advisors, Dr. Julio Benavides and Dr. Matt, Matt Haslam. Thank you very much. We couldn't have done it without you. At this point, I'd like to invite the rest of my team to join me for a Q&A session. Thank you, everyone, for attending, and thank you to our panelists.
so I'm saying good job. Um, kind of shame you guys didn't get to launch yet. So it's fun to see. Um, I do really have a couple of quick questions, and I'll leave it to the experts. Um, so going back towards the uh, propulsion subsystem, kind of around the slides 26, 28. I may have misheard what was said, but it sounded like you were talking about this subject. Yes, sir, that's correct. Okay, so in the process of casting these motor grains, are there sort of three of them? Uh, the motor grains were more than three, but we cast three separate motors that were tested in our first that phase of the show. So how did you maintain uh, quality control between each of the castings? Sure, I'm going to pass that off to Kyle here, and he's going to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, yeah, so in the, so in the uh, procedure that we followed for it, uh, we did a lot of stuff to reduce the uh, to air bubbles in it, and then also we cast the propellant for all three of those motors in the same uh, mixing session. Uh, and then for the flight motors, those were also cast in the same mixing session. Uh, so that's it, in order to keep a consistency between them. How did you cast the, uh, what, what kind of a mantle did you use for casting the motors? You mentioned that there's a sun uh, yeah, so for the mandrels, we had uh, aluminum mandrels that we had, and we put a, uh, uh, like a, we put uh, an agent on it that would prevent the mandrel from sticking to the propellant, so you could just pull it out. Okay. Because one of my concerns when you were showing that there was inconsistency between all the tests, I was wondering maybe there was a mixing error right. or something. But okay. Um, if I could just add one more thing to that, it's like for some of those quality control things we did, we used the vacuum pump along with the shaker table plate for those air bubbles, and additionally the mandrel there, uh, that we used a, a circular board all the way throughout. That's mostly just because we wanted an ease of modeling rather than uh, you know, more complex geometries. So now, actually, following up on that, um, I think it was the stage two motor, you showed the thrust curve for that. Did you that way? It's a uh, uh, yeah. How did you get that off of the pure cylindrical bore? So the, uh, the grain, the diameter of the bore was not constant throughout all of the grains longitudinally. It was changed towards uh, one end, and those had a bigger bore diameter, so those burned faster. Okay, all right, I can follow on that. Um, the last one just kind of popped up on slide 85. Uh, you talked about the fuselage requirements, and this falls on the 864, the various requirements for the system. But you don't actually state what the numerical values of these material requirements are. You mean on the strain or the margin of safety stuff? Uh, and so you see there, uh, just a quick bullet point, that it should be within the ultimate compressive strength of the material. What is the ultimate compressive strength? Right, okay. Um, yeah, I guess the reason why we went with the margin of safety method is I think. It, in retrospect, it's a little too vague. Uh, you know, we took into account the different, you know, uh, tensile ultimate strengths and compressible ultimate strengths of the material, and we just figured out which was the most critical of driving the margin of safety, and we kind of used that. But yeah, it doesn't actually correct. I mean, the margin of safety method's not a bad way to go. It's just usually you want to put as much data there as possible. Okay. Yeah. Let's do that. Then. All right. Now I'm gonna do it. Thank you very much. So I'm not going to pick on Kyle, even though that, uh, the propulsion stuff is, is really interesting. Uh, slide 31, I think, was your, your demo. I think it was test number two, the one with the kind of really big motor chops in it. Um, did you guys get data from those chops and determine whether or not uh, that would have uh, caused some major consequences if that had taken place during the flight? Yeah, so we definitely got data for that. The reason we didn't present it was we weren't able to you know, derive the coefficient that we were looking for. Mm -hmm. The reason. And yes, if we were to plug that into our simulation, that would give us very dire consequences. Actually, the fact that it's uh, chuffing and the direction of the thrust vector is changing throughout that video as well. Um, we are passively stabilized, and that's why we go so fast. You know, So that would have a huge implication because we're trying to go as fast as possible there just for the stability there. Was that a first stage motor or a second stage motor? Was it 54 millimeter? They were right? 54 millimeter uh, motors. They weren't entirely representative of the first stage or the second stage. Uh, okay. Obviously, that kind of effect would be very more critical if it happened on the second stage. Yeah. Well, if it happened on the first stage and it was enough thrust to let you leave the tower, right. let you lay down on the ground, and then start getting the motor, but that, that's a very serious safety concern. I've, I've had similar issues in the past with that. So, um, 
that is something to take into account. Uh, what changed between test two and three? Uh, what were you changing with the ignition sequence? It, it seemed like you were having major, major ignition problems, but I never got any answer as to what was being modified as those you know, go through. What, were, what was changing? Sure, across those three tests, we weren't actually changing anything deliberately with the ignition. Uh, what was changing was the chamber pressure. By the test three had a smaller nozzle diameter, so we had a, uh, a higher chamber pressure. I think that probably helped a little bit with getting more complete ignition across the board from ideally the same ignition from second last stage to the second motor and the third. Yeah, I mean, a nominal chamber pressure in the middle of the burn, though, doesn't kind of change your startup sequence at all. So. Right, and uh, maybe cloud can expand on this a little bit. So yeah, we do think uh, the ignition, the igniter we used was part of the problem for it. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that we actually changed after these tests is we actually use a much bigger igniters for our uh, stage one and stage two motors. Uh, and these, also, these were also longer igniters. Uh, the ones we used in those first tests was just a single igniter with a black powder that was pushed up the very top of the motor. Uh, and our new ones have that along with multiple uh, charges set all throughout the motor in order to more completely ignite the propeller. Cool, so that sounds like a really good outcome from probably wasn't necessarily what you were looking for in that test, but the igniter sequence was really important. Uh, Gani, you just brought up uh, static stability. I didn't see any sure. kind of discussion as to the full stack stability, booster stability after separation. Sure. The sec first stage after separation. Is there some backup slides maybe? Yeah, can you go to the appendix and go to the backup slides around the aerodynamic coefficients, please? Uh, so this is actually a big area that we need to, next slide, please. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the drag breakdown here. Uh, all we did was we used the first order approximation for each of the stages, or, sorry, both the flight configurations. That's the one where the stage one is still attached, and the second is the one where the stage uh, one is not attached. The issue here is that we used, once again, a subsonic method to determine static stability. Then we did some rough you know, boundary value condition modeling to see which direction the center of, uh, of pressure would move throughout the course of the flight as we got faster and faster. And we had, our assumption was that it would get more and more stable throughout the flight. So we felt comfortable applying this as it was configured. The issue was that we did not have the ability to precisely predict the behavior uh, down to a small level. Yeah, it would have been really great if you guys had a requirement for like the minimum static stability yeah. for each of those sections. And I'm looking at coefficient of drag, so I'm not sure if that's the right uh, chart. Yeah, can you go to the next um, slide? There should be a, we do have an analysis between the uh, center of gravity distance versus the uh, and then, and then just the last thing was I saw a lot of really great MATLAB simulation um, and not so much uh, comparison to any real world systems or examples and kind of seeing where your models fit in. It's really easy to kind of design yourself into a box and say, oh, we love our system, our aerodynamic, damp, our aerodynamic model is the best thing in the world. Where, what kind of work did you guys do to kind of lock those simulations into reality besides just waiting for a full systems test to set or a propellant test or something like that to lock it in? Sure, our original plan was to take the aerodynamics, for example, and uh, evaluate that in a wind tunnel or maybe some sort of computational method that would let us validate it on the ground before we just shut this thing up into the, uh, the full scale. We really understand the importance of that aspect of validating the model before the full scale test. It's just we didn't have a good way of doing that with the aerodynamics because of the resources we had available to us. I think the propulsion is a better example where we started off with some you know, ballpark numbers for what our characteristics are. We created a model based off of that, and then we did a small scale test to update those values, and then updated the model as a result. Thank you. So I want to say that you guys have a really good understanding of the integrated system of system, uh, because you have many components and you can figure out and tests and how they fit together. So I um, want to give you kudos for that. Um, the one question that I have for you, it wasn't really clear to me what you designed um, and what you designed, what you built versus what you prepared. So maybe could you walk that, once you walk sure. through that. Can we go to the product structure tree, the slide please? Yep. So as far as structural components go, the fuselage is the most you know, obvious here. We decided that we would like to purchase those off commercially available parts. Uh, the choices there basically limit us to step sizes and like, you know, diameter to get exactly what we um, and as a result, our fuselage is very overbuilt in many regards. But yeah, we built that just because we didn't want to deal with laying the composite in the geometry that you know, we wanted to manufacture. So if you look at the uh, product structure tree here, the airframe on each stage is uh, commercially sourced, as is most of the propulsion elements in terms of the motor case, the, uh, like the aft internals, the forward internals, and that kind of stuff. What we focused on building was mostly the, uh, the software side of things in terms of what's going to run on the avionics and know, uh, integrating those avionics together, as well as the propulsion uh, chemicals. We did a lot of work in terms of uh, making sure that we could manufacture those propulsion aspects. Would you like a little bit more detail? No, I think that's 
give me the ads or we'll give the ads. I just want to say a great job. Um, I thought you guys did a really good job setting the table of explaining what each test was, why you did it, and then going through the whole process. I thought that was excellent. Thank you. Um, really good on that. Uh, the only uh, real question that I had, um, I don't know, maybe I missed it. Um, on like slide 32, uh, you mentioned that you had propellant like an original prediction and you had your experimental values and you had a modified prediction. What was that modified prediction based off of? Sure. So we originally had this model that we were generating the predictions off of. And then we got this data and we derived the coefficients and so on. And then we updated the model using the, uh, the, the coefficients we got from the actual test to see it. did it more accurately predict the actual conditions. Okay. So that's the modified prediction. Cool. Yeah, just, just want to double check. That makes sense. And I think that's a good idea to do. So I just want to make sure that's what that was. And then I, the only other thing is that I thought your, on your lessons learned, your requirements definition, I thought that was excellent because okay. that's real world that, that happens all the time. So that's a really good lesson. So you have an overall really good memory. I uh, want to echo um, many of the things that were said here, so I won't repeat them, but um, good job. And um, one of the things I did like to see was that you were going to reuse the different parts on each of the different stages. So that's really important not to like come up with something new each time. Um, one of the questions I had, though, is when you started with the scope, and, and this may be just what you were given, but did you think that this was a little too much to handle in the, the few months that you had or the year? I mean, at, at, at what point did you say, okay, well, you know, you planned a test on April 5th, 19th, and it's the 27th, I mean, we're, is that cutting it close? I mean, no. obviously it didn't happen. <laughs> yeah, so I think that's a great question. Uh, the original request for proposal asked for a four-state rocket, and we were like, oh, there's no way we can make this happen in terms of the altitude and with the money that we had and all sorts of stuff. So we definitely made that choice like, almost immediately. Um, that was a big deal. I think that, yes, there was a lot of work that came from fact that the systems were all independent as well. They didn't share a lot of things that could have been uh, you know, integrated to reduce the amount of money, which would have made things go a little bit quicker, I think. Um, so having things independent almost actually made things a little bit more challenging in terms of uh, a financial regard. Um, but I do think that if we had made a few, if we, were, if we had the knowledge that we had now going into this semester, I do think the scope of this product could have been implemented across, the, uh, across this two semesters. And uh, coming from NASA, you know, we get our money from the science. I mean, right. the implementations, just the you know the necessary details to get the science. So could you go a little bit more about what your payload was supposed to do? Sure. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, you know, so on campus, there's a pretty high interest in towards of amateur rocketry and this type of stuff. Um, and you know, there's some software available out there for simulating the performance of these rockets and their various assumptions and limitations and so on. And it's either it ranges from free software to you know something. Between, but like we don't have access to big databases like missile.com and stuff like that, you know, where we can have like really precise understanding of how things are going to work. So we kind of wanted to update uh, a simulation that we used for designing further like future rockets and so on, while better understanding what the limitations of like our understanding are. If that makes sense. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Nice job. Uh, and uh, rockets. <laughs> One was uh, back on the initial test where we were collecting data and seeing the results and getting a sort of intuition towards how these systems behave. That's not really in line much with the systems engineering approach that we'd like to replicate, but yes. Okay. Awesome. Thank you very much. Okay.